Friday, the 13th of January, 1948, the flag of the United Nations stood at half-mast. Mahatma Gandhi was dead, assassinated. And for the first time in its history, the United Nations Assembly set aside a day's session to honor a man. Not the head of a state, a general, a king, but a lone man who, without army, riches, or political alliance, had been called the most powerful man of the 20th century. Who was this man that all the world should mourn over him? Five feet five inches tall, wearing a hand-spun cotton loincloth like the poorest of India's untouchables. What then was the power of this man? Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi was born in Porbandar in western India on October 2nd, 1869. His Indian forefathers had long ago discovered infinite sources of power unknown to the scientists of the western countries. This force is to be found not in chemistry or physics, but in the spiritual nature of men. The Indian people call this power the Atma. A man of unusual spiritual force is called a Mahatma, a great soul. While young Gandhi was a law student in London, England, he began to probe more deeply for an understanding of the nature of life, of truth, of love, of power. He studied not only his law texts, but two books which he believed to be the most important literature in existence. One was the Bhagavad Gita, the most ancient sacred book of India, and the other, the Bible. In the Gita, Gandhi learned about love, the force that holds people together and causes them to rise above themselves. There are good and evil in every man, but when a person loves, he strengthens the good in those about him. Truth, combined with love, is the greatest force in all the earth. Gandhi was to call its use nonviolence, satyagraha, a greater power than that of the largest gun or bomb or army. In the Bible, especially in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, young Gandhi found profound answers to his profound questions. The Gita and the Bible together offered to Gandhi's people the way of freedom and self-realization, and to these beliefs he eventually gave his life. Graduating from law school at the age of 22, he returned to India in 1891. He was sent to South Africa to represent the law firm of Dada Abdullah, and there Gandhi rose to great success and personal wealth. But the appalling social conditions all about him weighed on his mind with increasing heaviness. Neglecting his law practice, he began to teach and demonstrate the power of nonviolence, which he had discovered in the Gita and the Bible. In 1915, this amazing man, now 46, returned to his India. Multitudes of people gathered to hear his message of hope for freedom and dignity. He told them their weapon was nonviolent resistance against the political forces that had held them in crushing bondage. On August 1st, 1920, Lakamanya Tilak died, the Indian leader of the Congress party. He had been a man of fiery militant spirit, but he had recognized Gandhi as his political heir, the mild, slight man of the gentle spirit. The Congress Party, which had been organized in 1885, had become the central force in India's fight for freedom. And with Gandhi as its leader, the Congress Party established goals for a new India. The people of the untouchables caste must be given equality and dignity. Indians, both wealthy and poor, must discipline themselves to a new morality, no alcohol, no opium. India's 300 million Hindus and 100 million Muslims must cease their bitter and deadly rivalry. There must be equality for women, and the people must establish a productive economy. In 1921, he began the new program simply with a spinning wheel. India grew hundreds of tons of cotton annually, and yet Indians were unemployed half the year. Instead of sending their raw cotton to English mills, why not make their own cloth? Thus began the Khadi, or homespun, movement. And the women were being freed, 
The veils were coming off their faces. At the Madras Congress, there were clear signs of India's new self-discipline and self-confidence. Gandhi came, his hands pressed together in the Hindu greeting which means, my love and reverence to the God in you. When the 1928 Calcutta Congress convened, India was boycotting British goods and refusing to take jobs with the English government, but under no provocation did an Indian harm an Englishman. In 1930, Gandhi told the people about a letter of protest he had written to the British Viceroy, Lord Irwin. In the letter, he had voiced the Indians' bitter complaint about the type of British rule which reduced them to political serfdom. Great Britain has even taken from the Indian the right to make his own salt from his own sea, and yet Britain levies a tax on that salt when the Indian then has to buy it. Let there be a conference to discuss these many wrongs, he pleaded, otherwise, he must try to point out to the British the evil that they did. He and some of his friends would do this by a non-violent march to the sea at Dendi, where Gandhi himself would break the salt laws. The Viceroy answered through a secretary. No conference. On March 12th of 1930, at 6.30 a.m., a slight man, 61 years old, clothed in a homespun loincloth, moved against the British Empire. With 79 disciples, he started a 200-mile walk to the sea. Others began to join him. The Viceroy and other statesmen watched with curiosity. Still greater crowds joined him. From all over India they came. Journalists from other countries were flown in to report on this march, this protest, this feeble and farcical protest, this far-reaching and fearsome protest. Each day, he stopped for an hour to spin. He spoke to the crowd, saying, if any violence is shown against the British, then no matter what ends are gained, the march will have failed. On April 5th, they reached the sea. Then Gandhi marched into the sea, and from it he took a pan of water to be refined into salt. All along the shores of the sea, thousands moved in, each with a container to take out the water, distilling it, gathering the salt in great mounds. Soldiers came and confiscated the salt, but even yet more was distilled. Gandhi was arrested. People across the world, even the American and French governments, spoke out, questioning the British action. In India, millions of people demonstrated their impassioned protests. Soldiers and police sought to quell the multitudes with riot clubs. Still, no hand was raised against the British. On January 25th, 1931, Lord Irwin announced an end of the salt laws, as well as the release of Gandhi. The Karachi Congress appointed him to represent them at the Round Table Conference in London. He sailed from Bombay on August 29th, an infectiously happy man. In England, he attended the Round Table Conference of 112 delegates, most of them appointed by the Viceroy. As the meeting progressed, Gandhi realized that only division was being cultivated. Instead of a united India, plans were being discussed for a separation between Muslim and Hindu and Sheikh and untouchable and Parsi and Indian Christians. Meanwhile in India, during Gandhi's absence, the new Viceroy had made arrests without warrant had suspended court trials, had outlawed political organizations and meetings, had seized property, had jailed 100,000. Gandhi returned to India. His wife and young Jawaharlal Nehru and the numberless followers of Gandhi now call him Bapu, the father. Bapu began his work immediately. His first consideration was for that part of the great Indian family called the untouchables. For thousands of years, they had been ostracized. But Gandhi ignored this strange mandate of the culture, and he gave them a new name, Harijan, children of God. The British, however, perpetuated this ancient tradition of separating the untouchables by insisting that they have a separate vote in governmental matters. 
Gandhi now vigorously expressed his opposition to English treatment of the Harijan. And on January 4th, 1932, all India heard that he had been put in jail. Then they heard that Gandhi had gone on a fast. In the face of seething unrest throughout the land, the government took action. The 3,000 years of the untouchable segregation was brought to an end. But Gandhi recognized that official legislation would not be enough. Released from prison in September, he set out to change the heart of tradition-binded India in its attitude toward the Harijan. The Congress Party's program to shape a new India was slowly proceeding. The people were spinning their own cotton. Many of the oppressive British laws had been changed. The women had been given equality. The untouchables had been freed. And the country and the people had a dignity they had never known. Gandhi was dissatisfied. He was still looking for the answer to the great enigmas that were embedded in the life of his countrymen. So on October 24th, 1934, he announced his resignation from Congress. The essential life of India, he believed, lay in its 700,000 villages. With his wife, Kasturbai, he moved to Severgrad and began life as a simple villager. The world refused to accept his resignation. Congress leaders came to confer with this simple villager. Famous people of many nations and continents came to sit and talk in his one-room adobe hut. The floor was of swept earth, one rug, a spinning wheel, a soapbox for a desk. For a period of four years, Gandhi labored to develop communal life in the villages. Then a new unrest began to shadow India. England was threatened with war. What did that mean to India's hope for freedom? In 1938, Gandhi was forced back into politics. Serious differences of opinion began to manifest themselves in the Congress. Chandra Bose, now the Congress leader, was saying to the populace, give me blood and I promise you freedom. Gandhi said, nations are violently giving demonstration of savage and futile warfare as a means of settling their differences. Now is the time to demonstrate nonviolence as the better means of seeking agreement and truth. In 1939, when the war exploded over Europe and Asia, there were many who followed Boz. Nonviolence was too idealistic, too difficult, too slow. On March 22, 1942, Sir Stafford Cripps met with the Congress leaders and proposed that a new Indian constitution be drawn up after the war. Gandhi called this proposal a post-dated check and left the meeting not to return. He now had but two words to say to their English overlords, quit India. These words electrified India. They set off an outburst of demonstrations throughout the land. The jails were filled far beyond their capacity. Gandhi and Kasturbai were among the prisoners. And while imprisoned, Gandhi's beloved Kasturbai died, her head in her husband's lap. For 62 years they had been married. Gandhi said of her, she was more of me than I was of myself. After a dangerously weakening fast, the 75-year-old man was released from prison on May 6th. 75 years. What had been accomplished? Muslim and Hindu were hatefully engaged in outbreaks against each other. Britain still held India in a crushing grip. The world's warring temperament was creeping over Gandhi's people. Still, he went on, working, searching, praying. Then, on historic August 12th, 1946. Yawaharlal Nehru, Gandhi's friend, was commissioned by Sir Archibald Wavell to form the Indian government. While the new premier reviewed the troops at the frontier, Gandhi quietly and patiently traveled among the Muslims and Hindus who were at civil war with each other. But he went to Noakali, a district 80% Muslim, on a pilgrimage of personal penance because Gandhi believed he shared the guilt for this internal strife. He walked from village to village, living with them, learning from them, trying to teach them to love, despite their deep-rooted enmity. His followers, too, went to work in the villages, 
Hindus, Muslims, Harijans, Christians. And at his meetings for prayer, the Bible, the Quran, the Talmud, the Gita, all were read with reverence. The riots quieted. And on August 15, 1947, the flag of independence flew over emancipated India. Free India, proud India, jubilant India. Pakistan was declared a separate Muslim state according to the demands of Jinnah and the Muslim League. While the people celebrated, the British withdrew their military forces. Although there were problems still to be worked out, this was the consummation of Gandhi's dream. India stood before all nations as a symbol that nonviolence can be an invincible force. It can bring about the peaceful solution of international differences. And so independence came to India. And at the center of all, Gandhi, father, Bapu. But Bapu was not at the festivities. He had spent the day fasting and praying. There was still much work to do. He was growing old. His days were drawing close. On January 30th, 1948, at half past five, Gandhi went from Birla House to his prayer meeting. A man who feared Gandhi's teaching and power stepped forward and bowed to him. The man fired a gun. And so Mahatma Gandhi, a great soul, finished with his life. At dawn, they dressed him in the loincloth which he had spun and which throughout the world had become a respected symbol. There were garlands of flowers. The flag of India was draped over him. After the procession, the body was burned. And the ashes were sent to six continents and to all parts of India. But the spirit of the man had long preceded the particles of ash. His spirit was alive in the land, releasing truth, drawing people into relationships of understanding and trust, achieving dignified human stature, demonstrating the invincible power of love.